Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. So uh, this was the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. I read this as a sort of off-the-record little mini buddy read with Charlie, Charles Heathcote. And um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and read you the blurb from the back, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. As you can see, I made quite a few. Then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk, translated by Antonia Lloyd-Jones. In a remote Polish village, Janina Dosesko, an eccentric woman in her 60s, recounts the events surrounding the disappearance of her two dogs. She is reclusive, preferring the company of animals to people. She's unconventional, believing in the stars. And she is fond of the poetry of William Blake, from whose work the title of the book is taken. When members of a local hunting club are found murdered, Dosesko becomes involved in the investigation. By no means a conventional crime story, this existential thriller by the Nobel Prize in Literature laureate offers thought-provoking ideas on our perceptions of madness, injustice, against marginalised people, animal rights, the hypocrisy of traditional religion, belief in predestination, and caused a genuine political uproar in Poland. I apologise in advance for my horrible pronunciation, but I will do my best. So um, I wanted to read just the opening paragraph here of chapter one. I am already at an age, and additionally in a state, where I must always wash my feet thoroughly before bed, in the event of having to be removed by an ambulance in the night. And so our narrator, um, she gives everybody nicknames and refers to them by those. And uh, so we've just discovered a body here quite towards the beginning, and we have a... I glanced at Oddball in the hope of some consolation, but he was already busy making the rumpled bed, a shakedown on a dilapidated folding couch, so I did my best to comfort myself. And then it occurred to me that in a way Bigfoot's death might be a good thing. It had freed him from the mess that was his life, and it had freed other living creatures from him. Oh yes, suddenly I realised what a good thing death can be, how just and fair, like a disinfectant or a vacuum cleaner. I admit that's what I thought, and that's what I still think now. And so here the narrator says, It was hard to have a conversation with Oddball. He was a man of very few words, and as it was impossible to talk, one had to keep silent. It's hard work talking to some people, most often males. I have a theory about it. With age, many men come down with testosterone autism, the symptoms of which are a gradual decline in social intelligence and capacity for interpersonal communication, as well as a reduced ability to formulate thoughts. The person beset by this ailment becomes taciturn and appears to be lost in contemplation. He develops an interest in various tools and machinery, and he's drawn to the Second World War and the biographies of famous people, mainly politicians and villains. His capacity to read novels almost entirely vanishes. Testosterone autism disturbs the character's psychological understanding. I think Oddball was suffering from this ailment. I thought this was cool because this was quite telling of this character's class. Uh, by now I was rather lost in thought, so I found it hard to come to my senses. Gradually I gathered my wits as I headed after the woman for an audience upstairs, where the police commandant had his office. The commandant was an obese man of about my age, but he addressed me as if I were his mother, or even his grandmother. He cast me a fleeting glance and said, sit yourself down. And sensing that this form of address revealed his rural origins, he cleared his throat and corrected himself. Take a seat, madam. Just this one great little one-liner here. It's easier to cope with a snowstorm than a death. Another great quote here. As I gazed at the black and white landscape of the plateau, I realized that sorrow is an important word for defining the world. It lies at the foundations of everything. It is the fifth element, the quintessence. My uh, bandmate wanted to call one of our albums the quintessence of dust. I said no. Another fantastic little paragraph here. I grew up in a beautiful era, now sadly in the past. In it there was great readiness for change and a talent for creating revolutionary visions. Nowadays no one still has the courage to think of anything new. All they ever talk about round the clock is how things already are. They just keep rolling out the same old ideas. Reality has grown old and gone Reality has grown old and gone senile. After all, it is definitely subject to the same laws as every living organism. It ages. Just like the cells of the body, its tiniest components, the senses, succumb to, apo succumb to, apo succumb to apoptosis. Apoptosis is natural death, brought about by the tiredness and exhaustion of matter. In Greek, this word means the dropping of petals. The world has dropped its petals. I think this is a great quote here, starting off chapter 5. Uh, and all these quotes, I believe, are the, the quotes from the uh, Blake they're translating. Prisons are built with stones of law, brothels with bricks of religion. 
This sounds like some of the problems I have with my stomach and my IBS. She says, my ailments appear treacherously. I never know when they're coming. And then something happens inside my body. My bones begin to ache. It's an unpleasant ache, sickening. That's the word I'd use. It continues incessantly. It doesn't stop for hours, sometimes days on end. There's no hiding from this pain. There are no pills or injections for it. It must hurt, just as a river must flow and fire must burn. It spitefully reminds me that I consist of physical particles, which are slipping away by the second. Perhaps one could get used to it, learn to live with it, just as people live in the cities of Auschwitz or Hiroshima without ever thinking about what happened there in the past. They simply live their lives. But after these pains in my bones come pains in my stomach, intestine, liver, everything we have inside without cease. Glucose is capable of soothing it for a while, so I always carry a small bottle of it in my pocket. I never know when an attack will occur or when I will feel worse. Sometimes it's as if I'm composed of nothing but symptoms of illness. I am a phantom built out of pain. Whenever I find it hard to know what to do with myself, I imagine I have a zip fastener in my belly from my neck to my groin and that I'm slowly undoing it from top to bottom. And then I pull my arms out of my arms, my legs out of my legs and take my head off my head. As I extract myself from my own body, it falls off me like old clothes. Underneath them, I'm finer, soft, almost transparent. I have a body like a jellyfish, white, milky, phosphorescent. This fantasy is the only thing capable of bringing me relief. Oh yes, then I am free. There's a, a mention of a jar of pickled gherkins, which for some reason pickled gherkins keep appearing in all the books I read at the moment. A great line as well. Uh, fancy being given a body and not knowing anything about it. There's no instruction manual. We get this uh, at the start of a scene here. You have more compassion for animals than for people. That's not true. I feel just as sorry for both. But nobody shoots at defenseless people. At least not these days. Well, I don't know about that. People have a duty towards animals to lead them in successive lives to liberation. We're all traveling in the same direction, from dependence to freedom, from ritual to free choice. She continues this. I'm going to read it out because I think it's a great speech. I mean, I'm vegan, so, you know. You'll say it's just one bore, I continue, but what about the deluge of butchered meat that falls on our cities day by day like never-ending apocalyptic rain? This rain heralds slaughter, disease, collective madness, the obfuscation and contamination of the mind, for no human heart is capable of bearing so much pain. The whole complex human psyche has evolved to prevent man from understanding what he is really seeing, to stop the truth from reaching him by wrapping it in illusion, in idle chatter. The world is a prison full of suffering, so constructed that in order to survive one must inflict pain on others. Do you hear me? But now even the cleaner, disappointed by my speech, had set about his work, so I was only talking to the poodle. What sort of a world is this? Someone's body is made into shoes, into meatballs, sausages, a bedside rug. Someone's bones are boiled to make broth. Shoes, sofas, a shoulder bag made of someone's belly, keeping warm with someone else's fur, eating someone's body, cutting it into bits and frying it in oil. Can it really be true? Is this nightmare really happening? This mass killing, cruel, impassive, automatic, without any pangs of conscience, without the slightest pause for thought, though plenty of thought is applied to ingenious philosophies and theologies. What sort of world is this, where killing and pain are the norm? What on earth is wrong with us? You said it. And this, another great line here. The old method for dealing with bad dreams is to tell them aloud above the toilet bowl and then flush them away. I'll have to try that sometime. And um, we get this bit as well, which I think is typical of, you know, red tape. In an effort to help her, I went to the local authority, but I found out that there's no support, no grants for people like Good News. The woman behind the desk advised me to arrange a bank loan, the kind you pay back once you finish your studies and start to work. There are also free computer, dressmaking and flower arranging courses, but unfortunately only for the unemployed. So she'd have to quit her job in order to go on one. So we get this little conversation. If I wanted to write my memoirs, how would I go about it? I said, sounding confused. You must sit at the table and force yourself to write. It will come of its own accord. You mustn't censor yourself. You must write down everything that comes into your head. Strange advice. I wouldn't want to write down everything. I'd only like to write down the things that I found good and positive. I thought she was going to say more, but she didn't. I felt disappointed. Great little one-liner here. For some time, I shared my bed with a Catholic and nothing good came of it. We get a reference to them playing and singing House of the Rising Sun, but uh, then they forget the words after, Oh mother, tell your children not to do what I have done. And then we have another reference to Riders of the Storm by The Doors. We get the line, I couldn't help thinking that someone who overuses the phrase in truth is sure to be a liar. And we get this quote, People who spend all day tramping about the forest in search of mushrooms are bound to be deadly boring. 
Uh, Susie's into mushroom picking and stuff. Or at least she has been mushroom picking and knows how to pick the ones that don't kill you and the ones that make you trip balls. Which I know how to grow. Uh, we have the end of a chapter here, which I think is quite telling. Dizzy found a short video on the internet. It lasts no more than a minute. A handsome stag attacks a hunter. We see it standing on its hind legs, striking the man with its front hooves. The hunter falls over, but the animal doesn't stop. It stamps on him in a fury. It doesn't give him a chance to crawl away on his knees. The man tries to protect his head and to escape from the enraged animal, but the stag keeps knocking him down again. The scene has no end. We don't know what happened afterwards, either to the hunter or the stag. Lying in my dark room in the middle of the summer, I watch this video over and over again. And then we get the quote, drive your plow, drive your plow over the bones of the dead, from which the uh, book takes its, its name. And then um, the main character gets this great little, mini tiny little soliloquy here, but it reminds me of Charlie Chaplin's speech in The Great Dictator. What are you gawping at, I cried. Have you fallen asleep? How can you listen to such nonsense without batting an eyelid? Have you lost your minds or your hearts? Have you still got hearts? Uh, we get a reference to her unconventional teaching method. She gives the children Dorian flavored sweets. So Dorian is a very smelly fruit. And then we get a little bit of a twist at the end. It works all right. Uh, but overall, I, I did think this was beautifully written. I think that's kind of the thing with it. Uh, I like a lot of the messages in it as well. Uh, I like the kind of unreliable narrator going on. I think it's very well translated as well with some beautiful prose in here. So overall, I gave this a 4.5 out of 5, and I'm glad I read it. And I'm keen to see what Charles Heathcote makes of it as well. So be sure to check out his YouTube channel too, if you haven't already. So there we have it. That's what I made of Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.